Hello and happy Monday, my friends. This is Amy Lee San Juan, and it is always a pleasure to welcome you back to another great episode of Cisco Champion Radio, where we cover topics across the Cisco portfolio to give you the insights you want and need. Today, we are talking about enabling seamless onboarding with Cisco DNA Spaces. Particularly, we will discuss how you can seamlessly connect guests using open roaming, how you can enable automatic handoff between cellular and Wi-Fi to improve indoor carry connectivity, and how you can create differentiated experiences for your loyalty members through app notifications and captive portals. To help us navigate this conversation, we have Cisco champion co-host Shai and Dan and our fantastic Cisco subject matter expert Rishi. So kick back and join us for the next half hour or so. So as we uncover some helpful nuggets of information for you. All right. First on the agenda, introductions. Rishi, thank you for joining us today. Can you tell us more about yourself and what you do at Cisco? Thank you, Emily. Um, uh, I actually incidentally came into Cisco from an acquisition of a company that specialized uh, into onboarding. Um, And uh, that's how I got integrated into Cisco and that's how, you know, DNA Spaces was born out of one of the acquired product. Uh, And, and, you know, we extended that um, element of onboarding to cover a bunch of functionalities that you just spoke about. Um, I am the senior, one of the senior product managers uh, for Cisco DNA Spaces. And I specialized or rather my goal is to make sure that we have a bunch of customers that uh, get the most value out of uh, onboarding, uh, which means uh, enhance the number of customers that are connecting to their Wi-Fi uh, through seamless onboarding and open roaming. And it also means um, uh, extract most value out of some of our products like the Captive Portal and the SDK. Very nice. Dan, glad to have you with us today. Who are you? What do you do? Hi, I'm Dan. I am a senior network engineer with Sleep Number, Sleep Number 55. Um, I basically, joy of being a network engineer, I kind of get to work on everything. So data center, uh, campus networking, wireless, uh, and then we've got our our retail presence. So one of the the big interesting things for me in this topic is the the interaction with, you know, retail wireless networks and, and what this means. Good. Shy, always a pleasure. Tell us about yourself. Well, thank you, Amy Lee. I'm Shai Silver. I'm the director of network services at San Jose State University. Uh, really kind of excited about this product. We've been using this product, uh, DNA Spaces, for a while on campus, and we have a very diverse uh, uh, scenarios uh, that it's applicable for like retail and hospitality and uh, uh, event centers and football stadiums. So looking forward to discuss this topic. Yay! All right, Rishi, I'm going to pass the ball back to you um, so you can give us a little bit more background on what we're talking about today. Uh, Thank you, Emily. Uh, So if you look at Cisco DNA Spaces uh, uh, overall, right, our mission is to digitize uh, physical spaces, and and that includes uh, people that visit the physical spaces and, and devices that connect to the network in these physical spaces. And a larger part of that digitization initiative actually requires people and assets to connect to Wi-Fi, right? So it's all about connectivity. So what we are trying to do today is to um, try and talk a little bit about how do we make sure that more number of people connect to the Wi-Fi that you uh, you have set up uh, so pretty much uh, to get them a better experience within the physical space uh, itself. And uh, I think the answer to that is, is there a magical pill that allows uh, our customers to connect to Wi-Fi without going through the loops and, and bounds of, uh, you know, having, uh, uh, have, having to enter their phone number or having to enter an access code or having to do something that becomes like a friction point in that journey and, 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 and seamlessly connecting to Wi-Fi is going to be the key there. Open roaming, along with uh, some of the other technologies of Cisco, is actually what offers that seamless connectivity uh, in 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 that sense. <clears throat> uh, now, what is open roaming in that? Uh, you know, like why why are we talking about open roaming today? So, if you look at open roaming, it's basically trying to um, disrupt wireless roaming 
uh, and and by wireless roaming we don't mean wireless roaming within your network right going from one building to another building uh, within the same network it actually talks about can we form some kind of an alliance can, can we set up some kind of uh, a network where you have different access providers willing to accept different identities and and customers that kind of can roam into one another's uh, you know physical space without having a barrier to re-enter or re-authenticate against each individual network. So a scenario where uh, you know I'm traveling to the San San Francisco airport, I connect to the San Francisco Wi-Fi because I'm an AT&T customer. Uh, it automatically connects to the airport Wi-Fi. And hey, I I landed in New York State, and when I land there, I automatically connect to the New York airport Wi-Fi. And when I went to when I go to the Javits Center, I automatically can connect to the Javits Center Wi-Fi for an event that is actually happening there. So is is there a possibility to kind of create that experience, uh, just like a GSM roaming does for uh, service providers? Can we do a exact similar innovation through partnerships? In, in, in the Wi-Fi space. And, and and that's the topic today in terms of open roaming. <clears throat> Thank you, Rishi. So, uh, I mean, I, I know before we kind of dig into open roaming, uh, I, I know that the, I've been using DNA spaces uh, initially uh, for the captive portal. So do you want to kind of dig a little bit into, you know, what is the captive portal, some of the, the advantages of, of why you might want to use a, a captive portal? Uh, and then we can talk about the anti-captive portal, which would be open roaming. You know, thank you, Shai. I mean, it's a it's a great question. Um, uh, you know, captive portal actually uh, was created by these OS providers to ensure that there is a, a ease of onboarding or an assistant that allows you to, uh, you know, kind of connect to wi- Wi-Fi network, which is why uh, captive portal pops up uh, in what we call as a captive network assistant. It's actually an assistant that allows devices to connect to the network. And the assistant is nothing but think of it as a very mini browser, like a mini browser, not a full-fledged browser. If you have an iOS, it's not a full-fledged Safari, but it's like a mini Safari that allows you to, uh, you know, splash some information about your organization or your physical space. So if I'm connecting to, let's say, Sleep Number Store, it could just pop up a nice little information that tells me, hey, welcome to Sleep Number. Uh, You know, uh, you are uh, visiting the store on a great day. Here are the discounts that are offered. And by the way, if you want to connect to Wi-Fi, you could connect to Wi-Fi by giving us some information or just click connect to connect to Wi-Fi. So Captive Portal actually has been uh, uh, empowering businesses to not only allow customers to connect to their network, but also has been a conduit to collect information about customers and send some message to them through that network assistant. And, uh, you know, it, it would it would be great to know, Shai, is how have you been using it, uh, you know, in, in, in SJSU? And, and maybe, Dan, if you can tell us a little bit as well in terms of how you've been using uh, the captive portal. Uh, sure, I'd love to. Uh, so I kind of started uh, doing this, uh, for example, in our football stadium. Uh, we do have like some of our normal SSIDs, but we have guests. So uh, we wanted to uh, a provide a portal, provided uh, information about the game. Uh, but also we really like the fact that, you know, we were able to start giving uh, our athletics department understanding of who is visiting, uh, how many how many users are coming in uh, using the wireless, for example, and also tracking of how many how many uh, visitors are coming to every game or how many games, how long they're staying. So we started providing some useful uh, behavior uh, and through the data collection, we also allow them now to, based on email address, to start marketing uh, to people and communicating and engaging their customers uh, who are actually showing up to the game. So really, really helped them uh, in that fashion. Uh, the other cool thing that we, we have, for example, with one of our theaters that we have in downtown San Jose, uh, they do the same thing. I mean, they're able to provide internet, they collect the email addresses from people, uh, you can sign up for the uh, uh, for the newsletter, but now they start having more data about who are the customers who are coming in there and how to invite them to additional uh, events. It's also really cool that uh, they're the kind of customer that I gave them ability to also uh, s- uh, change uh, on their own. They have the ability to go and change the portal. So instead of giving a program when you come in, for example, uh, you can go online to the, uh, for example, the Hammer Theater, and you can see more about like uh, the concession, the night's program, and, and things like that. 
No, I, I was just saying that that's uh, that's awesome, Shai. I mean, one of the one of the things I want to call out in that initiative is that um, the ability to actually collect that information and pass it back to your CRM systems, right? And that's super powerful because uh, earlier there was no method or there was no the the ability to actually extract this information and get some value out of it, both from a consumer and a business standpoint, was missing. And and captive portals did play a pretty good role there to allow that to kind of tie that two, two pieces together. Uh, you know, how you guys are using the captive portal. So we're actually not using a captive portal. Our our guest network is essentially just kind of a, essentially an open guest network. Um, but this is, I guess, really kind of leads into where my next question would be, where as as a network engineer, you know, making sure that the the access to the the network is is secure, making sure that we're not exposed to anything is, you know, from a, a networking standpoint, that's our, essentially our primary goal is you know, establish that connectivity. Um, as you, as I think Amy Lee started off in the, the intro talking about the loyalty and we talked, you just mentioned CRM, I guess one of the big questions and I, Shai kind of mentioned this, but could you kind of talk to, as we're looking at getting this and getting more engagement with, with customer base or with, with users or, or whatever, you know, whatever audience we're looking at, uh, what are the tools that, that are available to really start getting, getting the right information to the right people? I, I, as a network engineer, getting getting data to a customer getting getting information from a customer it's not really something that's that's my purview so how how do you interact with the you know marketing or other teams or i think shy mentioned getting getting some programmability to allow allow teams to update those programs or or concessions or whatever it might be could you kind of talk to that a little bit no ab- absolutely i think great question dan and and i would also kind of ask shy to chip in uh, you know, in terms of how he's doing that for SJSU. But um, a, a product like DNA Spaces uh, offers you multiple, what we call as outcomes or, or multiple applications and uh, uh, that provides that capability or that ability to do what you just said. The first is, of course, Captive Portal, right? Earlier, this used to be purely in the hands of a of a network engineer, right? The problem that started is, hey, the design of this Captive Portal uh, is not something that, uh, you know, kind of considers the brand, uh, you know, that I want to portray, the brand messaging that I want to portray. So the first thing that we did was, I think, democratize that by giving you something called as a studio. So what happens is that, that a network engineer just configures uh, a, a basic captive portal and then hands it off to uh, somebody inside the marketing team that would like to look at this captive portal and design it completely on their own. So it's a what you see, what you get tool, drag and drop what you want uh, to show on the captive portal in terms of the widgets. Let's say I want to welcome my guests and and tell them what the store, what store they are connecting to. So there's a widget there that marketing can drag and drop and and kind of make make that magically work. Or I want to have a carousel that talks about the three promotions that are going on in my store today. And there's a widget for that. You drag and drop and make make that happen. So it's essentially giving you initially that power to hand off to your line of business how they want this captive portal to look and feel because that's the first touch point your customer has to the brand, right? Uh, Once you get that uh, piece in place, the second is, do I want to actually know my customer a little better from a demographic standpoint or, you know, or whether they are my loyal customers or not by giving them some kind of an authentication there? Or even an extent where, uh, you know, you want to capture their social information just to tie it in uh, to look at, uh, you know, what they do outside the store and what are their interests in that sense, right? So the next thing that came in is how how am I going to ask these guests to authenticate themselves? And and there again, uh, you know, the earlier there was this restriction of, hey, I can only do so much programming and, and uh, my project will not permit uh, me to kind of you know give you a social sign in in the next seven days i'm going to take uh, six months to get that done so what we try to do there again is to pre-build all these plug plugins um, and and integrations so that you don't have to worry about actually writing the code behind it right and you could just drag it, you could just select the type of authentication you need on these captive portals and and uh, uh, let that be driven automatically on that and 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 then there are these uh, what we call as the webhooks um, and, and the triggers 
that allow you to seamlessly pass this information to your CRM system, right? Without again writing a line of code, you, you could actually select an endpoint where this data has to go and sit uh, and, and configure that endpoint. And as soon as a guest walks in, enters their information or authenticates again against their social login, the data would flow through uh, onto your CRM system. So, um, Shai, how, how have you guys used the captive portal and, and you know what do you do with the, the integration components? How, how simple was it for you? It was very simple for us to, to integrate that. And we really just decided that we wanted to collect uh, email addresses for uh, and, and names. Uh, so, and then uh, the way the platform works is uh, we get an FTP every day of any of the authentications. And uh, given that it's a, uh, it's connected to what access points uh, and what SSID we're able to disseminate this information to uh, the right party of interest. So it, it, we found this like very, very uh, flexible uh, to do, but, but, but I, I really actually want to kind of go, go into it. I mean, it's like, I think it's really nice to have the captive portals. I mean, for some subsets and, and I talked about them in the context of, uh, like football game or, uh, or the theater where th there's really different content, but I think there's a whole different aspect of wireless today, which is how do we get people on? Uh, and especially on, on university campus, uh, we don't want to deal with captive portals. We don't want to have necessarily to uh, have to support. I mean, we want the network to be just like a light, right? You just turn it on because on our campus, I mean, we have all sorts of events, all sorts of people. I mean, I, ha I have like, you know, cons you know, cult concerts that come on through it. I have the pineapple uh, fan club. I have, uh, I, I have the goatee uh, uh, club meeting on campus. So, all of those people, it's like, they don't really need to know. I just want people to be able to come to campus and be able to just like be on the network. And, and I think this is where I see open roaming becoming uh, something that's, that's very, very unique. Because I, I think there's some issues with Captive Portal that we have to kind of discuss, right? And it requires user interaction. And sometimes you can miss an interaction with a uh, with an individual because maybe they, they're not going to go and sign in through the portal. Or maybe you don't have, a, they don't have the app. Whereas with open roaming, I think uh, we have a lot more flexibility because we, we can automatically authenticate and get them onto the network. No, ab absolutely, Shai. Like, like we discussed earlier, right? One of the big challenges of, of offering this Wi-Fi as a, as, a, as a service to your customer is the ability to attract the customer to connect to this program, right? And if they don't connect, um, there, there, are, there is always this aspect of, hey, has the program actually failed? Or is, do I need to do something else? You know, what what is that heavy lift that I need to do to make my connect uh, my customers connect to my network? And that's always been a challenge um, uh, in the industry. And and you are spot on. Open roaming is actually something that we are trying to, uh, 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 you know, which actually is an answer. And and that's exactly what we are trying to establish uh, as as a standard. Um, which is why when Cisco actually started off with open roaming and, and got it to a level of maturity, uh, it was prudent enough for us to let the WBA take over open roaming and, and you know, kind of make that as a default industry standard uh, to, to work with. Um, having said that, like, you know, uh, just like the captive portal, there, there are just two key components of open roaming, right? You have these identity providers, uh, you know, uh, that allow you to authenticate these devices and, and allow you to connect uh, to what we call as the access provider network. So in your case, Shai, SJSU being an access network um, allows, let's say, identity from AT&T, um, allows uh, identity from uh, Samsung hardware, um, you know, allows identity from Facebook uh, connected device, um, uh, uh, you know, and makes it a lot more seamless. So, so the experience would be: I walk into the network. I have an I have an AT and T SIM card. The eSIM kind of automatically authenticates uh, against the network, and the network allows that identity to be onboarded, and I get connected. So there is no friction. There is nothing that pops up. There is nothing that tells me, "Hey, select this SSID." There's nothing that. I need to go through, you know, is this a pineapple SSID? Is this a goat SSID? Is this a secure SSID? It just allows me to kind of automatically connect without having to worry about what am I uh, essentially connecting to. And, and the network is kind of provisioned, internet is provisioned, and I now have um, access uh, magically. So that's, uh, that, that's, that's the story. 
And what we are looking at is WBA attracting a bunch of these identity providers, right? And and we at Cisco working with them to ensure that uh, uh, th- there is the ecosystem growth uh, from an identity provider standpoint, as well as if you look at, hey, if there are enough identity provider, are there enough access providers in the world that accept these identities, right? So that's the other side uh, of, of the business and the focus that we are in, which is to ensure that there are enough access networks like you who accept enough identity to make it truly seamless in uh, in, in nature, um, and 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 that leads to an interesting question, Shai. Uh, how how has been your open roaming experience um, in, in your network? I mean, uh, what identity are you accepting, and and what outcomes have you achieved uh, by enabling those identities? Uh, so we saw a couple of things with open roaming, and I think it's important for for people to understand. Uh, uh, so we we opened the identities uh, at this point for the carriers. Uh, I, th- I believe we have uh, T-Mobile and AT and T enabled. Uh, I know that it's a, it, again this is a kind of an emergence emerging area. A lot of paperwork. So I mean the 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 legal paperwork to get IDPs on is is progressing. Uh, I believe we have the ability uh, to do it also based on Apple ID, Samsung ID. Uh, and uh, also, uh, more recently, I uh, believe Facebook is now, you can use a Facebook app to authenticate into it. Uh, uh, probably a lot of, a lot of the folks uh, may even not realize, but if you, they were at the last Cisco Live, uh, Open Roaming was there, and the Cisco Live app was actually your onboarding gateway onto Open Roaming, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so, so we see... Uh, we see that, but but the, the the issue that we do see, uh, because this does use a hotspot 2.0, uh, a lot of our uh, students already have, for example, uh, programming to their phone some of our prior SSIDs, so it doesn't prompt them to that. So this is going to work really well when people really truly work into a new environment where they the device is not really aware of any pre-existing SSIDs, and then it will automatically prompt you to uh, to log on. And this is this is both kind of uh, could be looked at as a positive or negative uh, because maybe I do want my students to connect to my student SSID and I want open roaming more for guests. Uh, but uh, it's it's also kind of really nice. For example, when you go into a concert, uh, I'm not sure if a lot of you know uh, uh, Cisco is sponsoring uh, the wireless at the Battle Rock uh, concert that's happening next weekend, and it's going to have open roaming. And uh, and that's going to be a brand new network. So chances are, vast majority of the people are going to be able to automatically join open roaming, uh, and uh, and and that and because it's a brand new environment. So for those kind of environments, massive onboarding where you still want identity uh, makes it easy and seamless. Uh, open roaming is 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 the answer for that. Absolutely, and and in fact, you know, you you did bring out a good point uh, in in terms of the friction of a known SSID concept, right? And that's exactly where Cisco and and uh, uh, you know our ecosystem partner, let's say whether it is Apple or Android, uh, I mean Google in that sense, are are trying to steer some of these things to solve for that majority of connectivity or majority of attachment, right? So one of the things that we are working with our ecosystem is to see. Uh, whether hotspots can be given a higher preference over known networks, uh, known unsecured networks, let's say, like you know, public networks that are not not secured, if if that comes into um, uh, into being in in let's say iOS 15 or iOS 16, you would actually end up um, uh, you know overcoming that issue where devices ha- have to choose the priority between, hey, I already know the network, let me just connect to it and and not worry about the hotspot that's sitting in my device. That gives me the capability to connect to a much better, uh, let's say, uh, secured network and 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 uh, a policy that governs that secured network. So I'm a, I actually want to change gears a little bit because we've we've touched on a couple of keywords, and I, I want to make sure that we're we're very clear. So we've talked about identity, we've talked about authentication, we've talked about Facebook as an example. When somebody is signing in and we're getting this information, just to be clear, I'm not getting their Facebook usernames and passwords. I'm getting an identity token that says, you know, this is this is shy or this is, you know, whoever. You know, I, I'm getting an, a piece of identity information. I'm not getting their raw authentication data. Absolutely. So, so you know, it's a good point touching upon the privacy aspect of it. Uh, open roaming is not going to be a, a solution that kind of violates that 
that privacy principle, right? So that opt-in aspect will always continue to be uh, with you, um, you know, as an access provider, as well as with the identity provider in terms of uh, the options of sharing that identity or not. So let's say that, you know, I walk into your network and I have the open roaming app. I'm authenticating using my Google identity or my Facebook identity. The option is going to be with me as a guest, as a consumer, whether I want to share this identity with you as a access provider or not. In case of more, uh, you know, embedded identity like the eSIM or the device SIM, like you rightly said, uh, you know, you are just going to get a hashed um, uh, UDID that is generated by open roaming that can uniquely identify that device so that there is some value in the data that uh, that you are able to kind of use for making certain business decisions on one end, uh, like, you know, knowing is this, a, is this a customer that regularly comes into this particular store or not? And at the same time, you know, in exchange for knowing that valuable information, uh, providing an experience to me as a consumer when I walk in, right? Either it could be as simple as, welcoming me to the store, uh, you know, or as simple as knowing, um, uh, you know, offering me an, a, a discount on that particular day, or, you know, in larger and more matured um, uh, retail uh, customers, what we have seen is that they have a data model that powers some of these exchanges in the back, right? So they actually know the past purchases, they know how many times I have visited your store, and they actually create a model that gives the best possible offer back to me as a consumer so that you know uh that experience is kind of extremely valuable so i i think is also kind of another interesting thing with the identity here and that is uh today we're approaching the age of random act randomization we connect to a network uh so i think uh, some ability to connect an identity is also very key to uh being able to uh to somehow connect your users now uh, now, do we have also have the possibility of uh, tracking and doing uh, uh, cellular offloading, leveraging open roaming identification? Uh, excellent point, uh, Shai. Uh, we we do with open roaming. You know, you have the infrastructure capability to actually offload network traffic onto your access network, right? I mean, uh, cellular traffic onto your access network. Uh, it's uh, it's just a bunch of configurations. So what we are trying to do there is uh, for all the service providers that actually are a part of the uh, identity federation with the WBA and, and open roaming, their settings are, are pre-embedded into uh, your configuration. So you don't have to do the heavy lifting of, let's say, hey, how do I allow only AT&T network to get offloaded onto my, uh, uh, you know, uh, at and uh, I mean, customers to get offloaded onto my uh, access network. You could actually just get into DNS spaces, uh, open the open roaming app, and in your configuration, just select at and as a domain. Uh, the rest of the heavy lift is kind of handled by, by open roaming application uh, in, in, in itself. Uh, however, to get to that point, it is very critical to know that all these service providers become a part of the program, become a part of the identity federation powered by the WPA. So what one part of what Cisco is also driving is to get them join the program and, and to extract that value because th there's a value exchange there, right? Today, if you see the spectrum that the service providers are operating out of, it's it's already limited. The density is extremely high. Uh, you know, the quality of service that they kind of offer is sometimes compromised. Uh, there is also this reservation in, in public that, uh, you know, spinning off uh, multiple cell towers have detrimental health issues, right? And I don't know how, how far that that statement is true, but as a result of that, you see these dense populated residential areas avoiding cell towers, right? And 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 that is a way for service provider to kind of you know get a better service or deliver a better service even in in those uh, areas through in partnership with access networks like yours. So uh, you know, I mean, and and that's the goal with open roaming as well. The good thing is the infrastructure is in place. All you need is a Cisco powered network. Uh, you need a DNA spaces connector that is set up um, and you need to configure open roaming on the DNA spaces app. Uh, as long as you are able to do these three things, uh, uh, you know, you now have multiple ways in which you can onboard your guests to your guest Wi-Fi through, through open roaming. 
So, so it looks. I mean, Cisco is kind of joining the 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 cult of companies that are going towards subscription services and licensing. So I think uh, we really need to kind of goat the conversation a little bit toward uh, what are the licensing requirements to make this work. Great question. Uh, you know, always interesting to kind of you know handle this aspect of uh, licensing that comes on 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 the way. But what we've done is the 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 open roaming as a base offering is included in your DNA Advantage license. Right. So uh, if you have your underlying infrastructure subscribed through the DNA Advantage, you get open roaming along with it. Right. And uh, as you kind of progressively go higher up uh, in terms of, you know, the the outcomes that you want to kind of gather, it requires certain level of enhanced services to offer. Let's take carrier offload as an example, right? Carrier offload is always going to be tied to a predictable service that your network can offer to the service provider. And therefore, it means that uh, your network has to have this ability to keep passing information about, uh, let's say, some SLA could be an SLA uh, of, uh, you know, how long does it take for a device to get an IP address once it gets connected to the network, or it could be how long does it take after the device is authenticated to be provisioned the internet. So the heavy lift of some of those SLAs um, is also kind of something that Cisco offers, uh, uh, you know, as a mediator between you as an access network and the service provider through uh, the DNA Spaces Extend uh, API program. So if you want to really extract the value of a consistent uh, experience offered through carrier offload, you do need to get um, to DNA Spaces Extend. Uh, incidentally, we heard a lot of you uh, and, and what we've done is, you know, kind of got Extend to be a part of DNA Advantage. So essentially, you get both the carrier offload program as well as open roaming uh, within your DNA Advantage licensing. And that leaves out the cap. Is there a licensing difference if you're using? Uh, sorry, is there a licensing difference uh, if you're using, uh, I guess, Cisco Enterprise Wireless or Meraki Wireless? Uh, no, because uh, it is offered uh, today with a. We have a joint SKU as well with Meraki, right? So, so the good thing about DNA Spaces is it's Cisco network agnostic. So we don't treat Meraki and Catalyst differently in terms of uh, the feature set that we offer and as well as the licensing that we offer. So there is uh, obviously a much better DNA licensing uh, with Catalyst Network and, and we set that really well. And we've also launched a SKU with Meraki uh, that offers you these, these services on top of a Meraki network. So that leaves just one licensing shy. shy uh, so, sorry, Dan. When you talk about the the value that this adds, there, there's the technical value. We've also talked a little bit about the marketing and customer experience value. Uh, with that, is this something when when working with with customers, is this something where you're you're kind of leading and talking to marketing teams? Is this something where the expectation is the technical teams are are bringing it to marketing teams? the getting into that that open roaming and the identity everything that goes into this what's what's kind of the i guess the go to market strategy that's being used with this great question uh so it's actually multiple right if you look at anything that cisco does the starting touch point is always good being it so so there is a very clear gtm that actually works with uh, us talking to the it team you already have an existing relationship there you already have uh, sold uh, existing licenses there. And it's just essentially trying to communicate the value of what more can they extract out of the existing license that they already have bought. And sometimes this communication is with IT because that's where we kind of communicate at the first level. Uh, but we have also realized the fact that some of this, um, uh, you know, some of these outcomes are better consumed uh, through line of business entities, uh, you know, within the organization. So we have started to also work with, uh, 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 you know, different channel partners, direct, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, direct visibility on on social media, where we actually talk to the line of business users that actually end up using our products and and explain to them uh, various outcomes that are kind of possible. Um, so let's say, you know, you would. You won't be surprised if you would see a campaign on LinkedIn on your CMO's, um, uh, you know, LinkedIn profile, which talks about, hey, have you ever 
uh, thought about using your existing network to um, gather sufficient CRM subsegment data through onboarding on Wi-Fi, right? Or uh, trying to talk to a, a, a you know a workspace resource about hey, have you thought about using your wireless information to determine the occupancy in the building, right? So so there are these different messaging platforms that we have started to use. Uh, but as far as the core GTM goes, we still actually use uh, our IT um, channels uh, to kind of pass the message on and, and, and then use them to help us get introduced to the next level in their business, um, on their business teams. I, I see this, I mean, I kind of see this uh, to answer your question to uh, Dan is, uh, you know, it's kind of like a, a tool or foundation for digital transformation for a lot of different different areas. So I think it really depends on where organizations are driving the digital transformation from. Sometimes it comes from marketing. Sometimes it comes, from, you know, from uh, outside parties. Sometimes it comes from IT. It just, I think, varies, which is why you have to market this to a lot of different uh, market segments. Uh, also, I wanted to add that's like I mean one of the the improvements I've seen uh, in dealing with uh, connecting the wireless network into into the whole um, uh, DNA spaces was uh, in the past you needed to connect the controller directly to the cloud. Now with the DNA spaces connector, you can run a virtual machine. You can run it in. Uh, run it as also in, a, I believe, in HA mode. Uh, so you really have kind of an enterprise level of redundancy and connectivity, I mean, for this critical service. And I think wireless is now the most visible service to customers, I think. Uh, absolutely. And and to add to those different channels, I, we actually have also launched the connector uh, on, on AWS. So you can actually now host the connector on your own instance of AWS without having to kind of host it in your data center. So uh, so that's that's one aspect of it. And like you rightly said, some of our customers actually use the wireless offering as a differentiated experience that they offer to their custom, uh, to their consumers, right? Uh, let's look at hospitality in that, that segment where, uh, you know, everything is pretty much the same. It's a hotel, you stay the night, uh, there are certain level of uh, efficiency in the room that is provided to you, certain level of digital experiences in the room that is provided to you. But what uh, kind of differentiate differentiates is how much of a personalization can I actually offer in the room now? So when I walk in, can the room automatically set the temperature to what I kind of prefer? Uh, can the television automatically connect to my device and stream the content that I actually have already personalized on my device. And 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 that's where uh, a lot of focus kind of goes in as well, um, uh, you know, to make sure that the wireless network, the underlying wireless network offers the capability for this level of personalization and digitization. So, so I, I, I think like, uh, another question I have here, I mean, there's, I mean, there's, there's so much possible, but uh, maybe you can, can quickly summarize what can you do out of the box and what can you do more with an app and the API so people can understand what, what's out of the box versus what they can develop. Uh, absolutely. So, uh, you know, for, out of the box the, at the C level, let's let's look at the licensing, different licensing tiers and what you get out of the box, right? With C, you get the capability of open roaming and and uh, accept cloud identity providers uh, you know accept your um, uh, your uh, own identity uh, as well uh, your your loyalty identity as well uh, either delivered through uh, the open roaming app or uh, essentially through your captive portal right uh, and and that's kind of available to you so you can configure it and and start turning it on and, and using it as soon as you have dns spaces set up uh, as we move up, we get into the extend license. You now have the capability to onboard uh, carrier traffic onto your open roaming setup uh, because you are now having the ability in extend to exchange your SLA data uh, from your network to the service provider. And that happens through a, through an app which is pre-built into DNA spaces uh, that allows you to kind of you know extend that information. So that's on the extend layer. And the, the highest tier of our licensing is the ACT licensing, where you have uh, available out of the box um, captive portal and, and captive portal templates. So there are a bunch of templates. We have about 37 different templates of captive portal that allows you to either use social sign-in, uh, mobile number with an OTP, email-based authentication, or a direct uh, connect 
you know prompt on on the captive portal so we have a bunch of out of the box captive portals that you could do we also give you a studio along with that which essentially means that um, you could customize whatever you like using the studio uh, and it also comes with uh, the next level of element which is a css editor which is where your developer developers and and your ui developers can go crazy they can actually do whatever they like with the css editor um uh, the other element of uh, you know out of the box uh, factor uh, are the apis that you can actually plug into your crm the, these are pre-built apis that are available to you or connectors that are available to you that can stream the collected information or data into your crm systems without you having to write a bunch of line of code um, as well customization as you know is something that can go um, you know many miles right you could start by customizing uh, a simple captive portal and make it more yours by targeting it to specific loyalty authentication so you now have a loyalty api and your ability to integrate that loyalty api into the captive portal or you could actually use the dna spaces sdk and and build a, a unique application that that uses all the underlying powers of dna spaces and offers it onto your app be it uh, authenticating via open roaming uh, be it collecting information and passing it uh, through your own different channels and, and your own different backend so uh, uh, and there are a bunch of apis outside of the sdk that are available there's a firehose real-time streaming api that actually exposes all information that dna spaces collects from the underlying network and makes it available um, to you you could then build this um, you could build any application that uses some of the events from the underlying network data uh, as well as a bunch of apis around location um, you know and location strat uh, based services as well all right well uh, this has been another phenomenal episode of cisco champion radio perhaps the goat of all episodes Thank you for listening in today. <laughs> uh, if you want to learn more about today's topic, just click on the link provided in the description below. And just a reminder, you can subscribe to Cisco Champion Radio on your favorite streaming platform and receive alerts on our latest releases. So wherever you're listening to us, make sure to hit or softly click on that subscribe or follow button now. I hope you all enjoyed today's episode. See you next Monday.